All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, Jamil Anderlini, who's the Asia editor of the Financial Times, and, and I want to kick off and, and welcome you all. Uh, uh, we have a, a kind of a rare concordance this evening. Uh, the next person on stage is David Teese from the Haas School of Businesses from New Zealand, as is Jamil. And in the honor of this uh, happenstance, I've worn my only shirt from New Zealand. So if I look a little florid, please uh, forgive me in these academic climes. Um, so why are we here? Well, not to labor the point, I think it's fair to say that the, the world is at a important moment when the US and China, the two largest economies, are in a state of changed grace. And everything that goes on between us, whether it's business and trade, which is, of course, the thing we read about most, but also uh, things like scientific research, academic life, cultural exchange, uh, really everything where we interact with China is under reconsideration. And that is what is known as decoupling. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, first in a short panel, then in a, in a debate. So without further uh, 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 exegesis on what's going to happen, let me uh, let uh, Jamil come up and say a few words. It's a great partnership we have with Nikkei uh, and the Financial Times. They brought seven, eight, nine people out. Uh, we did an event in New York uh, yesterday, last night, that was really interesting. So Jamil. Thank you so much, Orville. And uh, yes, there's a serious Kiwi contingent in the house tonight. Strange for this part of the world, I think. But uh, uh, I just really like to thank Berkeley for hosting us this evening. It's such a wonderful campus, a wonderful uh, venue. I'd really like to thank Orville, who's really, without Orville, this, none of this would have happened. Uh, and the Asia Society has been very kind in, in working with us. Um, we, the initial genesis of this idea, when I called Orville up, I said, look, um, you know, he, he and I, he's, he's sort of a god in the eyes of uh, China covering journalists. And uh, I called him up and I said, look, you know, we're all really interested in these topics, but, but also uh, I'm trying to promote this new thing uh, called Tech Scroll Asia, which you'll see up the top there. Basically, this is a collaboration between the Financial Times and our parent company, Nikkei, and at the moment, it's a weekly email newsletter, which you can sign up for as a subscriber. And pretty soon, if you're not a subscriber, you can also sign up for it. And it's really, uh, it's, it's run by uh, James King, who's the global China editor at the Financial Times and really one of our most distinguished uh, foreign correspondents. And Mercedes Rule, one of our rising stars in the Financial Times who covers uh, technology in Asia for us. So the two of them put together with the help of Nikkei, uh, an amazing um, uh, weekly newsletter about technology throughout Asia. Obviously, uh, that's got a large proportion from China. Um, but it's not just China. It's all of uh, technology in Asia. And it's really meant to, to inform uh, particularly American readers, but all readers around the world about technology and what's happening in technology in Asia. And it draws on 170 journalists uh, that the, the Nikkei and the Financial Times have outside of Japan uh, throughout Asia. And it's really, I mean, I really urge you, if you're interested in technology, as I hope you are living in this part of the world, and you're interested in Asia, which you wouldn't be here if you weren't, uh, I urge you to, to sign up and have a look at it. Um, one little data point, uh, it comes out on a Wednesday morning US time. And if you, I don't know about now, uh, the, the mysteries of the Google algorithm are, are, are beyond me, but if you were to Google US-China decoupling yesterday, the number one search result on Google was Tech Scroll Asia. So uh, we're very, very pleased about that. Thank you, Google. And we didn't pay anything to Google for that. So <laughs> very pleased about how that worked out. Um, so uh, I'm going to get off the stage now. Uh, soon I'll be back as your moderator for the, uh, for the debate that we're going to have. But first, uh, Professor Thies, my countryman, uh, is, going to, is going to give a few words and then introduce the Chancellor. We're really grateful to you too. Thank you so much for being here and uh, I'll be back soon. Thank you. My job is to introduce the Chancellor, which will be easily. But let me begin by saying 
I think this is the most important topic of our day. Uh, it flows into not just economics, not just technology, but into national security and into the long run performance and survival of liberal democracies. So these are really big issues. And the business school, which is happy to host this event in Chow Hall, I should point out, uh, is uh, obviously involved and engaged in the management issues that are associated with decoupling and with US and China. In fact, while the debate is framed, should there be decoupling, we should recognize it's starting to happen. And it's a really big issue for Silicon Valley. It's a really big issue for China. It's a really big issue for the United States. Whether it's the appropriate course or not is something uh, that we all need to think about. It. it is an issue that will implicate and is already implicating the university. We have a lot of international students here. Uh, we have joint ventures and joint relationships uh, uh, of a research kind in China. And uh, these issues will come under the microscope uh, as, as time unfolds. So we're on to a very important issue that we all have to pay attention to and make sure that it goes the right way for global prosperity and for global peace. Let me just briefly introduce our Chancellor, Carol Chris, who has uh, done a magnificent job here at the University of California. I like to say she's figured out how to manage the unmanageable. Uh, <laughs> the University of California being highly decentralized requires leadership for success, and she has delivered that in spades. Uh, under her tenure, the international scope of what we've done has expanded, the number of international students has gone up dramatically, and importantly, the tech commercialization activities of the university have expanded uh, enormously, and there are lots of very successful accelerators and incubators on campus, and we are involved as a university very much in uh, the US China technology transfer issues. So these are not remote issues for other people, they're issues for us, as well as for the nation, and as well as for the world. Carol? Thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the campus for what I know is going to be a fascinating set of discussions about US-China relations and the push for global technological supremacy. For the last few decades, and arguably since World War II, the United States has enjoyed unparalleled technological strength and has reaped the economic and national security benefits that accompany it. At the same time, American public perception of Chinese technology and Chinese high-tech companies has tended to be dismissive. Many have believed that Chinese imitation of Western technology, sometimes propelled by intellectual property theft, meant that Chinese firms could only copy, not imitate, not innovate. Guided by President Xi Jinping's call for China tech to catch up and surpass, however, the country has challenged such ideas. In recent years, China has built world-class industries in everything from 5G cellular networks to bioengineering to artificial intelligence to quantum computing. In the minds of Chinese leaders and many Chinese citizens, technological progress is not only a means of achieving economic and military might, but also an ideological end in itself. The restoration of China as a truly great power on the world stage. To many US policymakers, the prospect represents an existential threat to the United States global position and its own international agenda. Now we're seeing stirrings of a so-called war for tech supremacy as import tariffs are imposed, patent enforcement is debated, and restrictions on the, on the use of competitors' technology are set. So how will that war play out, and who will win? These questions entail a truly staggering array of dimensions, from levels of government and private investment in R&D, to the strength of existing tech firms and their near-term priorities, to market size, manufacturing prowess, mobile infrastructure, regulatory environments, consumer spending, and the complex, broader political issues in play for both nations. One area of particular importance to me as Berkeley's chancellor 
is the expansive role that universities play in this complex landscape, whether in building a talented workforce or developing new technologies and innovations. Today, record numbers of Chinese students are enrolled in college, record numbers are studying abroad, international partnerships with Chinese institutions are proliferating, and the stature of China's universities and researchers is increasing. This is a very positive development, and we should be proud of the role we and other universities have played in the increasing excellence of Chinese higher education. The Chinese government has made investment in higher education an essential element of its competitive edge, even as the objective is complicated by state policies aimed at controlling inquiry and expression. Our university, meanwhile, long a proponent of international engagement and with deep, numerous, and varied academic collaborations in China, is now grappling with how we show support for Chinese students, scholars, and institutional partners suddenly cast as objects of suspicion. The relationship between the United States and China is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. At a time when the greatest challenges are not national but global, challenges like climate change, energy use, the future of human health, it is inconceivable that we not work with China in multiple ways. This is particularly important to universities who operate on the principle that new knowledge and innovation develop best in an open environment in which we disseminate our discoveries openly and freely. Indeed, on the basis of this principle, many universities prohibit classified research. We begin to move into dangerous territory when we start to define protected research, not just as research important to military security, but all research important to economic competitiveness. The issues at play in this complex landscape loom large and are scattered across the front pages of the Financial Times and other media outlets, as well as debated in academia and discussed at the highest levels of government. I'm proud that Berkeley can play host to such a distinguished group from the Financial Times, the Asia Society, and the Haas School of Business, and I'm eager to hear our panelists take on these pressing questions. Thank you, and with that, on with the show. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm going to turn my chair a bit just all the better to see you all. Uh, so, the US, as we've heard, the US and China are on the cusp of an era of decoupling. Indeed, it's, it's already begun. Um, and this is, a, this is a trend that's going to change the world in the months, years, and decades ahead. Uh, what is decoupling? In, I hope we get into this in this, this debate. It's a broad description. It can mean different things. But put simply, the US has decided it needs to disentangle its relationship with China in key sectors in its own natural interest and security. The US government has put Chinese tech at the heart of this campaign. And tonight, I have a great panel here to discuss what this means. So I'll start with, uh, with Robert Atkinson here, founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. He's recognized as one of the world's top think tanks for science and technology policy. Robert leads a prolific team uh, of policy analysts and fellows that are successfully shaping the debate, setting the agenda on a host of critical issues at the intersection of technological inter innovation and public policy internationally recognized scholar, widely published author, um, who the New Republic has named as one of the three most important thinkers in innovation. 
um, and we also have Dan Wang here, studies technology at Dragonomics, a global macro research firm based in Hong Kong and Beijing. Uh, he writes about tech and at the moment his specialty, fortunately for us, is figuring out China's technology capabilities and how quickly they're improving. He was born in Yunnan, grew up in Canada, he was even uh, a Royal Canadian Army cadet as I found out, went to school in the US, worked in Silicon Valley, um, and his work on China and technology has been quoted by the Financial Times, Bloomberg, New York Times, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, so then we also have, of course, Orville Shell, been described as God already tonight, so he needs no introduction. Um, but as we know, he's a longtime China observer, author, journalist, uh, former dean and professor at UC Berkeley, is currently the Arthur Ross Director of the Center on U.S.-China Relations at the Asia Society in New York City, uh, and co-author with John Delury of Wealth and Power, China's Long March to the 21st Century. And last but certainly not least is Li Chenzhen. CJ, I'm allowed to call him, uh, is a neuroscientist, so brings, a, 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 I think, a very unique and special view tonight. Uh, he's currently the university chair professor of Peking University, and aside from his scientific research, he's also devoted to education development, uh, ranging from high school, undergraduate, medical students' education, but he's also um, an active and very courageous writer. Uh, he posted uh, an article last year uh, that rebuked many colleagues and ch Chinese intellectuals more broadly uh, for their, and I quote, shamelessness and cynicism, and for being increasingly spineless in fear of suppression from the establishment. So with that out of the way, I'm going to kick this off with you, Orville. What does decoupling mean, and how did we get to this moment? It is very striking that, you know, after three decades uh, more uh, of what we call engagement, where the presumption was that the two countries, if they only could trade, exchange, and interact, would slowly come closer together. And that was set in motion by Kissinger back and Nixon back in 1972. And we kind of got very accustomed to that. And it seemed to be like, almost like a force of gravity. And in the last few years, we've had this radical shift where suddenly all of these kinds of exchanges that we assumed were positive have begun to be viewed uh, with great suspicion, greater suspicion, because of a perceived threat from China. So that is a critical element of this whole equation. Is there a threat? What's the nature of the threat? And how did the threat arise? And I don't want to go on and answer all those questions right now, but I will simply say that I think part of the key to that puzzle is the present uh, government of China under President Xi Jinping, that some of the things that now are at the top of their agenda do cast China into a perspective which makes people feel quite uneasy. It's more assertive, more aggressive, it's wealthier, it's larger, and not to be overlooked, it's also more authoritarian. So I'm going to skip to uh, CJ, to you. I mean, is this idea of decoupling, is it, is it sound? I mean, is this what's truly behind it? What do you think? Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm the Asian who likes math, by the way. <laughs> uh, one thing to mention that I actually, I've been in the United States for 25 years. I was the uh, uh, neurologist and neuroscientist first at Cornell Medical School and then at Mount Sinai. Uh, so then I moved to Peking University in 2013. So I firsthand I experienced on both sides. Now, one thing I want to sort of advocate is a perspective change. When we talk about decoupling and all that, I feel we're too into the zero-sum game sort of scenario between US and China. I would advocate jumping one step ahead using a more global citizen sort of perspective and look at that. China, by the way, is 20% of the humanity. So that gives a different perspective. And the first one I want to say, yes, I totally agree and see the danger of many of these 
IP theft and the aggressive posture and all that I do. But I want to add something more to today's discussion, which is instead of decoupling, I am much more on the side what I called principled engagement. And I think that's the way to go. And the reason is, fundamentally, I question the notion that for 40 years, the engagement has failed. My experience, and both at Peking University and into the Chinese society, says there's another side to it, which is, it may surprise you, I think liberal democracy is winning in Chinese society quietly, irreversibly, grassroot-wise. So that's the basic assessment I have. And if you want, I can add more later. I'm, um, in, I'm interested in that, because I think there's several million people in Xinjiang who might disagree. Ah, yes. <laughs> OK. Um, those are also, I have no argument against that, the Xinjiang, the Tibet, and all that, the recent Hong Kong issue. But if you look at the general public, the way their lifestyle is, if you count how many of the top leaders' sons and grandsons are in the United States? Last year alone, 360,000 students came to U.S. alone. In Peking University, 60% of my department's undergraduate students end up here. Among them, I think there's one student from my lab who was a uh, physics Olympia gold medalist. So the the realization of going west and appreciating the freedom of speech, the not only life quality, but the whole nine yard is definitely there. So I think that counts, really. Now, the why we don't hear that much, because the voice is, it doesn't show. But these are the people, by and large, their formal education is after the Cultural Revolution, unlike Xi Jinping's generation. So those are the upcoming generation, and I have pretty good feeling about them, and the whole value system is progressive. And based on that, I think we do have a, an optimistic view of that. And in education, I think this is one area that U.S. can exert very positive influence on China through the academic collaboration. When you get in, for example, science, it's not only about electrons or DNAs. It's about a whole set of thinking. It's a whole system of enlightenment. It's about the basic concepts, supporting data, logic, debate, freely exchange ideas, and trial and error the courage to say things people don't believe, all that is positive. And it's taking root in Chinese universities. Mm. Peking University uh, is one of the examples. So I think that's a positive side. Let's keep the channel open. There might be areas that we do need to decouple, maybe. But keep the higher education as much as possible interactive. Do not suffocate that channel, which is cultivating the next generation of leaders and, and people who will change. The old guards will retire. Give it 10 years, 20 years, they will be gone. But the newer ones, we should not close the door because that's the leverage we have. Since when United States won the war by withdrawing? United States won all the wars by engaging. And I think the United States should be patient, confident, and with a great perseverance. Thank you. I, you know, speaking about things taking root in a new guard in, in China, Rob, um, in your excellent recent report, Is China Catching Up with the U.S. Innovation? You quote Carly Fiorina saying, Although the Chinese are a gifted people, innovation and entrepreneurship are not their strong suits. Their society, as well as their educational system, is too homogenized and controlled to encourage imagination and risk-taking. Is America still deluding itself? Is this an emergency for the US? 
Yeah, we've long been deluding ourselves because in the U.S. framing, there's only one recipe for innovation success, and that's the recipe we've used, which is light touch regulation, free markets, and limited roles of government. It's worked very well. But there are other recipes, and we've seen that, for example, with the rise of South Korea. South Korea, they're not very creative. They have rigid schools. They jam stuff into your head. They're not that entrepreneurial, and yet they've turned into becoming one of the leading technological countries of the world. They do more R&D as a share of GDP than any other country, so they're able to do it. I want to come back to the decoupling thing because I think it's an important way to frame it. The, the, the standard frame is why is the U.S. instigating decoupling? And I think that's really the wrong way to think about it. it it's akin to asking a, a woman who's been married to a philanderer who is abusive, why are you divorcing this person? <laughs> well, she's not the one really making the divorce. Uh, it's the philanderer. And, you know, we, po we coined this term back in 2010, uh, innovation mercantilism, which is what we articulated in China was doing. China could have stopped this. They could have prevented this from happening easily, easily. They could have reined in intellectual property theft. They could have reined in massive subsidies. I mean, they're giving over $100 billion writing a check just to one industry, the semiconductor industry, in violation of WTO rules. I mean, there's all, go down the list. And the Chinese government thought that they didn't have to do it because we'd continue to go along with it. And, and that was really wrong. I mean, even if Trump wasn't elected, in my view, um, a president would have come up and finally the consensus would, wait a minute, we've got to confront them. So I think the, the choice really in the, US, in, the US, in the Trump administration right now, there's really sort of three main camps. There's the let's sell them more soybeans camp, uh, which is kind of treasury, if you will. Uh, that camp is, there's really only one camp that matters and that's the president, but, uh, and, and that just, I think everybody in Washington now acknowledges you can't continue to do what we've been doing. So the second camp I would say is the Bob Lighthizer camp, which is let's confront them, let's get a deal that really forces them to roll back their innovation mercantilism in ways that are enforceable. And then there's a third camp, which is, which is kind of Navarro and the NSC, which is, wait a minute, that's not going to work. The we, we can't do it. The Chinese are never going to agree to it. Even if they agree to it, they're not going to stick to it. So we've got to decouple. And, and I guess to Orville's point, I think if China had gone along with that second route earlier on and made some real concessions, they don't, nobody's asking them to give up state capitalism. It's what they are. But I think what people are asking them to do is tone it down don't steal as much. Don't force companies to give their technology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think they, they're the ones who are responsible for where we are today. And, and I mm -hmm. think the question then is, where do we go from here? Well, Orville, where, where do we go from I, here? I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think if you look at what happened to engagement, actually, I think <laughs> America was kind of a model of leadership through seven administrations. We tried to make it work. Oh. And, you know, I, I think any partnership has to be reciprocal. And I do think, again and again and again, China missed incomparable opportunities to level the playing field, make it more reciprocal, and they didn't. And the Americans, our side, were so possessed with the idea of not running the train off the tracks each time we, we sort of said, oh, well, all right, it's not worth a train wreck. But then you see what happens at the end. It's like how you started off with your marriage. Uh, not, not, a, not a particularly charming metaphor, but uh, apt. Uh, I've, I've got to go, of course, this is a tech panel, so I do have to go into the tech side, which is, Dan, your expertise. I want to ask you about China's aim to reduce dependence on U.S. tech imports, particularly in chips. How, I'm interested in your perspective, how derailed have they been by U.S. export controls? Can they manage it? How long will it take? Uh, does the survival of a company like Huawei so far um, prove the resilience of Chinese companies? Right. So I think it is uh, really important now for China to figure out something as important as semiconductors. And I think semiconductors, 
not everyone had realized uh, up to this point how important and foundational they were to so many different types of technologies. And I think the major event uh, of the last 18 months uh, has really been uh, not just this Huawei thing. I think uh, what has been quite a bit more important was uh, in uh, May or June of last year when uh, the US designated uh, ZTE, uh, kind of a smaller Huawei, onto the denied persons list. And in the aftermath, uh, in about two months or so, ZTE, I, I think, uh, had a pretty stunning fall. Uh, in about two months, it more or less had to declare <coughs> bankruptcy. And until uh, President Xi reached a political solution with President Trump, uh, it really didn't, uh, couldn't get going. Uh, and so basically, I think the, at this point now, the, uh, China understands very well that it really needs to figure out semiconductors. Uh, the figure that we're working with is that uh, the China is prepared to commit something like, uh, as Rob said, over $100 billion uh, on to uh, basically making this semiconductor uh, work. Now, uh, whether uh, China really is able to figure out this technology uh, is uh, something that we are uh, looking pretty closely at. Uh, and this is a very difficult technology for China to figure out. It's not as if it hasn't been trying for uh, at least over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, at least over the last you know, 30, 40 years or so. Um, now, uh, I think I, I'll just uh, answer in a fairly more uh, abstract uh, and longer term uh, uh, view of this. In, in my view, uh, it is uh, pretty difficult for any country to monopolize uh, a key technology uh, over a very long time. Uh, technology tends to diffuse. It's what it does. Uh, and so I'm thinking uh, back uh, in the uh, maybe roughly 17th century when the UK tried to export control uh, its leading industrial technologies uh, to the US uh, by banning these exports, um, the US still managed to figure it out uh, pretty quickly. Uh, there, was this, uh, there were a couple of people who just more or less memorized mill designs uh, and then built new mills uh, in uh, New England. So there's one particular guy, Samuel Slater, uh, the, the, the UK uh, refers to him, I, I believe, still as a trader of the Slater uh, for having just memorized a bunch of designs and then built uh, mills in uh, Rhode Island. And um, you know, I, I used to work here in Silicon Valley. The saying that we had here is that uh, knowledge travels at the speed of beer. Uh, beer or coffee, <laughs> bigger poison. People just chat about this stuff. It's in the air. Uh, and then uh, it, uh, this is the sort of thing that tends to move on. Now, whether uh, this moves on quickly enough to rescue Huawei, I, I don't think so. But just in general, uh, China is about trying to replicate a lot of different technologies. It's not trying to invent them de novo. And I think that is a little bit uh, of a just, um, more straightforward process. Mm. I'm interested as well. I mean, one of the things that we've come back to in Tech Scroll Asia is can you can you just partially decouple, or do you, can this only lead down one way into a total severing? I mean, is there, is there a way that this can be done a bit more nuanced and say, you know, you brought up ZTE before. I mean, there was a lot of flip-flopping on that kind of, on that policy. Is there, is there a better way of doing this so that you can do a partial decoupling? Well, I, my view is that that's the challenge. Yeah. You, you, you have to do that because the world is a global, globalized, coupled world. But having said that, I have to also add that I think China is very poor at doing, you know, cooperating in a friendly way in one realm while being in a state of extreme contradiction, maybe adversarial relationship in another. And I would also say the U.S. has its problems, too. Uh, and, uh, you know, Carol alluded to her concerns about uh, you know, uh, the United States has been known to end up with witch hunts when it turns against certain mm. countries, certain races, certain people. So I think each side has got an immense challenge in picking a judicious path forward. But that's the challenge. If China does make more concessions, I mean, do you see engagement working again? We you know, last night in New York, uh, we had the, the, the guy who's been running Asia in the National Security Council uh, um, give us a little rap. And that was exactly the question I asked him. Uh, he's now the deputy national security advisor. I said, if China comes around, is the door still open? Well. And he gave us a long talk on ideology. But then, and he's, not a, <laughs> he's a very intelligent person, he said, yes. Yes. OK. But I'm, I think there's some people who don't agree with that. Well, I mean, it also, 
just interested as well, and I mean, how far from the US side this this uh, decoupling goes? I mean, Dan, you wrote a report entitled "The Rising Risks for Chinese Firms" a couple of months ago. You correctly wrote that more Chinese firms we put on the entity list, um, and indeed, last week, I think it was last week, we we saw that happen. We saw some of China's top AI firms uh, get added to the list, um, and then there's plenty of discussion about the finance sector, uh, Alibaba. Um, Ten cent. I mean, is this is this the way it's going? Well, uh, I think it's a political question of whether uh, the U.S. <laughs> deploys its tools. But what I can say is that the U.S. has a very substantial toolbox indeed. Um, if you look at uh, financial sanctions, uh, these are all possibly coming down the line. We can have Magnitsky Act designations, which deprive uh, U.S. Uh, which deprive, excuse me, Chinese firms of access to certain uh, U.S. persons, uh, and then also the USD. Uh, there are all sorts of um, the, uh, the sanctions that the Tr Department of the Treasury can unveil to deal a lot more pain to the uh, Chinese technology sector. Uh, and then also, you know, uh, the Treasury is also has the discretion right now to cut off uh, three Chinese banks uh, from their correspondent uh, U.S. accounts. And so these are China's fifth largest, seventh largest, and ninth largest uh, banks, which are currently under sanctions risk. So the U.S. has a very large toolbox uh, to deal pain uh, on in terms of the financial sanctions and then also in terms of the technology stuff. Um, now, and, and I think that now the question, uh, the longer term question is, how how long does the U.S. really have this power? Now, uh, if China figures out something like te technology, with uh, especially on something like semiconductors, then if the U.S. deprives uh, Chinese firms of semiconductor technology, all that does is cut off its own company sales from mm. selling to a very large customer. Uh, and then if the uh, Chinese are able to reduce their dependence on the U.S. dollar, uh, then this is uh, also uh, part of what they can do. And I think we're seeing uh, China engage in both projects, very big projects, uh, with much more determination. Yeah. Can, can I just add to that? So I think there's three th main things that the U.S. needs to do in this. One is, uh, and we're already seeing it happening, I think the Chinese government is making a huge mistake by thinking they can rope-a-dope this, which is their core strategy is rope-a-dope. It's been that strategy for years. I'd, I went to these SNED meetings when I was helping out the White House, and you see that that's what they do. And they have this belief that they can just wait out Trump. And I think that's a huge mistake because with the tariffs on, what you're seeing is American companies moving production out of China. Uh, Apple moves half of its earbud or ear something over to Vietnam. There was just a big announcement last week about some company moving to Malaysia. Um, so I think part of what we need to do is we need to have much tighter relations with some of these other countries, which is why we should have had the TPP. It would have made it a lot easier to do that. But still, uh, we need to make it clear that if you move your production to Malaysia or Vietnam or whatever, you're going to have good access to the U.S. market. And that, I think, will make it easier for American firms to move. They're not going to move everything out of China, but they now, American supply chain managers and C-level folks, they understand that being in China 100 percent in is a highly risky strategy that they don't want to do anymore. So that's number one. Number two, and I think we should follow what the Japanese are doing, Japanese are on a huge automation tear. Uh, the more we can automate, uh, we're going to be able to have bring production back. Or that's why we need a much more better a national robotics strategy. We, we fund robotics at a teeny little bit in this country, uh, robotics research at universities. Uh, they do a lot more. And then the third area, that, and I think that's where I 100 percent agree with Dan, there, there are strategic things we can do that really do inflict an enormous amount of pain on them. And I think we should be careful and strategic how to do that. The best case to me was uh, Fujian Hinghua, which was a, uh, essentially a state-funded DRAM company, a dynamic random access memory chips, basically, you know, memory chips. And it, they built the largest factory in the world to make these, even though we have many, we have much DRAM chips as we need in the world. They're basically doing to DRAMs what they did with steel, where Chinese now can produce all the steel in the world. Uh, and so what they did is they built this factory with a huge check from the government. I mean, it wasn't market-based. And then they stole the technology from Micron through a Taiwanese subsidiary. And so what the administration did is they kept, they, they cut off technology flows from applied materials, I believe. Um, to that factory, and it really did hurt them significantly. And, and we can see the same thing with Huawei, where it really can hurt them. And so I think in those kinds of cases, we should be very uh, willing to apply those kinds of interventions. That's very different, though, than just saying we're going to try to decouple writ large, which I do think would be a mistake. 
I mean, I agree. We are seeing huge supply chain shifts in Asia uh, and many big tech companies shifting or planning to shift work out of the mainland and Taiwan and Vietnam and Dan, you've written a lot about this, um, are two countries seeing the benefit uh, of this. But I, I mean, size wise, how much can these countries really ever replace China? Um, and Dan, one for you as well, I'm interested in this. Uh, how does Taiwan stop itself getting caught in the middle of this? Is that a country like Taiwan? I mean, it's remained pretty enthusiastic about making sales to Huawei, for instance, in the middle of all this. Right. And so I think the, 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 the situation in Taiwan is really interesting because the Taiwanese contract manufacturers are basically uh, China's largest private employers. So if you add up all the contract manufacturers in Taiwan, there's about a half dozen of them. Uh, names like Foxconn, Pegatron, Wistron, they employ about 1.5 million people uh, assembling the world's uh, uh, electronics. And here I uh, really should give some credit to uh, the NAR reporters, uh, Lolly Li and Chen Tingfang, who have done a really excellent work uh, covering basically a lot of this uh, supply chain movement stuff. And so um, just to uh, put a little bit uh, more meat on the bones of what um, uh, Rob said, I think it is absolutely the case that many companies want to move a lot of production they, they, uh, out of China. But I, uh, at the rate I'm seeing, it is still a very, very slow progress. Mm -hmm. So uh, Pegatron employs about 200,000 people uh, distributed between Quinshan and Chongqing, uh, assembling uh, a lot of smartphones and all, all types of other electronics. This year, it's committing to move about 2,000 jobs over to Taiwan, and it's moving about 2,000 jobs over to Indonesia. So that's about 2% of the workforce. Uh, that's not trivial, but it is not a huge uh, amount just yet. And I think if you look at the other uh, contract manufacturers, names like Wistron, yeah, moving to Malaysia, Foxconn is focused more on India, it is still very light trickle out of there. But I think it is definitely the case that some of that more is happening. And if you look, uh, take a look at uh, Taiwan, I think uh, it is, uh, it's tricky to say that uh, Taiwan can benefit uh, too much uh, in this case, because Taiwan's population is about 90 million people. It's smaller than Guangdong, China's manufacturing powerhouse. It is uh, pretty supply constrained, uh, as far as I can see. Um, they have uh, what they refer to as the five lakhs, the uh, wu chen. So uh, what they lack are uh, low-end labor, high-end labor, water, electricity, and land. These are pretty substantial uh, lacks if you want to engage in a lot of manufacturing. Um, there just isn't that much uh, labor there that really wants to do all this type of electronics. A lot of the uh, higher paid labor are either entrenched in uh, very well paid jobs or they've already moved to China. Um, there's not that much land close to major distribution centers. Um, electricity is a little bit of a concern because they're decommissioning uh, nuclear plants. Uh, and then water, there's some uh, storage uh, issues there as well. So I'm a little bit skeptical that um, these um, uh, much smaller places are able to uh, benefit uh, much from this. But I, I think uh, you know, uh, some um, crumbs off the table is a, is a feast for these smaller places. Mm. I'm going to blatantly steal uh, one of my colleagues' questions from our discussion last night, um, which is uh, putting ourselves five years from now um, and what kind of decoupling and what decoupling will look like and what you imagine it to be. Um, you know, will it be hitting trade? Will it be hitting tech? Will it be one country suffering more than the other? I'm interested in hearing, realizing our time is short, so interested hearing from each of you where you think we'll be. Well, I think it depends, and, and I should have been a little clearer. I, I actually think you use these kinds of measures, the entities list and other, I, I would use them as weapons to force the Chinese to come to the table with a good deal, with a light, if you look at the original Lighthizer deal in May, that was a good deal that the Chinese walked away from, and to me, they made a huge strategic mistake by doing that. I would use those weapons to get them to the table to make that deal. I, and the, the, one of the wor worries that I have is that there are lots and lots of American jobs and American know-how and capabilities where we're exporting things to China. I don't want to give that up, and I think that would be that would be a strategic mistake. We want to be selling them as much as we can. Everything we sell them is one thing they don't make. So I, I think it really largely depends on who wins the election in 2020. I think if Trump wins the election, then I think we're going to continue to see a stronger push toward much deeper and stronger decoupling. I think if a Democrat wins, someone like uh, Senator Warren, I think she would tend to be tough on China, but I don't think she'd be a decoupler. Um, this is beyond my expertise, uh, but I want to raise an awareness of one thing. I think it's important in the discussion, which is I don't feel the paramount goal of Chinese Communist Party now is to be a 
global dominant role. I think the fundamental thing that it's worried about is actually regime survival, literally. It has been like that, it is now, and it's going to be like that in, in the near future. Um, with the amazing achievement aside, but look at what they are facing. You have econo economy not really increasing because the low-hanging fruits are, are done. Uh, and there's corruption, there's inefficiency, there's uh, a very big one, legitimacy of, mm -hmm. of the regime. Uh, there's Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, Taiwan issue. All of that lumped together. I think they are facing a true, not a, a paranoia, a true existential question that is the regime going to exist? So I think that is what they are really looking for. Even those aggressive postures, the IP and all that, I think we understand that, if I understand that, as a reaction um, to this sense of urgency, sense of risking. Um, and I think we, if the decoupling to some degree occurs, that will definitely slow things down. Mm -hmm. But I remind everybody that it's unlikely that will make a break in the Chinese society. It's already there. The middle class in China is probably more than the U.S. population altogether. It's a huge market demand on its own. And the science technology has advanced to the degree that they, they, they will, you know, it's a less you know, efficient cell phone, but it's still a cell phone. I don't think it will hurt that fundamentally. But my worry is, depending on how we do it here, it may hand the regime one trump card, and that's the only trump card it can play, which is the nationalism. So we need to be very careful what to do, how to do. And I'm not an expert, expert, but I feel that is going to be very important in five years, whether this decoupling is bringing a positive push to the Chinese society and the regime, or strengthen its rule and because it can arouse this whole nationalist a fever in China, that's something we really should look into. Orville, I'm, I'm just going to skip, I'm going to start to you. I mean, you talked about Xi Jinping's China uh, at the beginning of this. I mean, is this, is this, do you agree? Is this a regime that's going to be fighting for survival over the next five years, or is it one that's fighting for domination? Well, I think it wouldn't mind being dominant, but I do think its primary concerns are, uh, as uh, uh, you know, we've just heard, uh, survival. Uh, but what I worry is that in the process, I mean, we've got a historical trend that was, it's been reversed from engaging to decoupling. And we're, every day we're sort of losing the musculature between these two, you know, absolutely critical global powers. And, we also have a number of piles of dry tinder lying around like Hong Kong. I mean, I, I frankly don't see a good, good way out of Hong Kong. I don't predict anything either. But, and then you look at Taiwan, I mean, that is an incredibly dangerous situation. And it wouldn't take much, and we wouldn't have much capacity to resist it, to have one of these flashpoints. Don't forget the South China Sea. China has claimed the entire maritime uh, expanse from the South China coast to Indonesia. And the Seventh Fleet is there contesting it. The, the Chinese are disobeying the international court rulings. So it wouldn't take much to just, just, just get this thing off to the races. And we're losing the ability, I think, to get into a steady state, stay in a steady state. And that's very worrisome. Very hard to turn historical trends around. It was hard to turn engagement around. And it's going to be harder to turn decoupling around. Can I add something? Of course. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree with that. And I think the danger, the biggest danger I see is also Taiwan. Not Hong Kong, but Taiwan. I agree. Uh, I do want to mention one thing. I think time is on our side, literally. Because 
China, as good as it is in, in developing, it's still trying to catch up rather than leading. U.S. is by far, and the Allies, is by far dominating. I'll give you an example. There are 2,568 prescription drugs. How many China contributed? 0 0.5. Why? Because it's not even one, because it's an old target. There's zero new target, new drugs. It's trying to catch up. And that aspect, so going from making shirts and shoes and all that to the high tech arena, you need two things. The first one, you need the top talents, top, top talents, which China still lacks. The second one, even with the talents, you need an environment, an ecosystem to allow them to have the critical thinking, the free debate, uh, the courage to disagree and all that, which I don't think it's there yet. Even at Peking University, Tsinghua University, these elite places. Therefore, I think time is on our side. That gives us more time to do a well thought, strategic planning, like Henry Kissinger you know, many years ago. Uh, one thing, don't forget the US strength is its talent pool. Many people say, aha, Chinese, there are 1.4 billion people. Yes, but you know what? U.S. draws talents from 7 billion people. As simple as that. So I think we need to be more vigilant, need to be more proactive, but I would advocate very cautious <coughs> planning, very careful planning. I'll let Dan just give them, because we're, we're vastly over time, but Dan, we from I'll Beijing, five, five years, will, will China still be behind, as, as CJ says? Um, I suspect that uh, China will make pretty good progress because, um, you know, the, the U.S. has responded generally to the rise of uh, the USSR and Japan by focused a lot on, uh, you know, doing R&D and improving its own position. And uh, in this case, I think the U.S. has been uh, able to, uh, you know, kneecap Huawei. And I think uh, instead of realizing its own Sputnik moment, uh, it is triggering one in China. And I think that mm -hmm. is uh, really focusing minds on really having to figure out this technology. The very last point I'll make on, on decoupling and to uh, uh, just follow up on CJ's point um, on talent, uh, here is a decoupling idea that I think could come true uh, in, in a little while. Um, and that is uh, through export controls. The US has a stiffened export control regulation that will define many more technologies to be export controlled. And uh, it, the specific uh, um, risk here is the idea of deemed exports. The US uh, defines an export in extremely broad terms. It's not just the sale of a final good across borders. Any transfer of information to a foreign national can be deemed an export uh, because it's a transfer of information to someone, uh, a, a, a foreign national. And so if you consider this deemed export idea, and then you consider that the US will define uh, AI to be a control technology, many types of semiconductors, uh, I think there is a real risk here that the US uh, has to, US companies here have to figure out if they have to sequester their national staff, foreign national staff, or terminate them. Otherwise, they would be in violation of US export control laws. And so this is one uh, a case in which the US might be unwinding its own uh, talent pool. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. But you can ask the uh, panelists after the show anything you'd like. I'm sure you're still, they're all still around. So thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone.